All right. I want to make sure that everybody is signed in so that you can leave your email address or your phone number if you want to be contacted um, because there's going to be a series of these meetings. And so we just don't want to miss anybody. And um, number one, and then number two, um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can call the council office and Liz will know what we're doing. Okay? Is that all right with everybody? Okay, great. Um, I'm Councilwoman Ortiz and I chair the meeting. I also represent District 3 and I'll let my other two colleagues um, introduce themselves if they would, please. Karen Hiller, District 1. Mike Padilla, District 5. Okay. Um, next, I will, well, I'll call the, order, call the meeting to order. That's already happened. Approval of October 5th meetings. Thank you. That's next on our agenda. Karen? I have a technical correction on that. I know we're using new words for folks, but um, on page two of the minutes, um, it talks about profiling and disbarred treatment, and that should be disparate treatment. Okay. Um, I, I don't know that that's just a technical amendment as far as I know. So um, the other thing I, I noted was that um, we had a whole list of things that we talked about under um, use of force and, and how we were going to do our agenda. And I thought that on our agenda today, we would be applying issues of bias, profiling, bias or profiling and training to all four of our items rather than just one. Um, again, I, I don't know that that's a, a change to the minutes. I just caught it there. Okay. Uh, so well, with that, I would let's, move to- let's start with the, we'll start with the first um, word that you wanted. Is that important to you that that word's there and not the word that's there now? Is that I think it was a mistake. Okay. Mistake. So I think it's a technical correction. Okay. Uh, I wanted to make those points, but I would be happy to move to approved minutes. Okay. Mike, are you okay with that? I'm fine. Okay. All right. And then the other thing, you know, this is just kind of a set agenda, but we can do whatever we need to do um, to adjust it because we're just getting started. Um, so. Um, I'm just going to ask for some special time and, and we can do whatever we need to do to adjust it and that might have to happen so okay with that you'll move to approve the minutes okay second it's been moved and seconded all those in favor raise your right hand 3-0 list okay let's go to number three discussion of use and force and who has the floor is that you I'm here to Okay. I thought we were going to have a presentation. I provided uh, a host of policies to the, the committee over the past few weeks for review. Mm -hmm. And I'm open for questions about those policies. Okay. If I may. Yes. Madam may. Chair. Um, if I could ask, uh, I understand that, and I appreciate you giving us those materials, but I'd like to be able to have some open discussion about the topic for the people at home who haven't had the privilege of having that information available to them. Sure. So Captain, what I'm hoping that we can do is to uh, first recognize that of some of, of the issues ha that have been brought to the council, use of force seems to be at the hub of a number of them. And I think that's the interaction between law enforcement and the community. And if you could give for us a, not a super detailed understanding, but why and how use of force is part of uh, the role of law enforcement in this community, why it exists, um, how it's uh, trained in the goal of the training uh, as to is it um, a protection of citizens and officers. Um, those kinds of overviews I think are important because it, I think uh, again for the people who are watching the, the meetings, it would be helpful uh, for some of that to be 
at least spoken to to some degree to help understanding? Certainly. Um, and I, I think you said it quite well there. I mean, use of force is um, something that is taught and trained in every law enforcement um, agency across the nation. And it is just that it's for the um, protection of uh, officers. Mm -hmm. um, it's to defend um, citizens. And it's also um, at times the protection of um, the arrestee or uh, the detainee to protect um, them as well. Um, as far as the use of force uh, training goes at, at this agency, it's, it's very in-depth uh, training, not only from the uh, hands-on uh, practical, um, uh, you know, showing efficiencies in, in those in those techniques and tactics, um, but from the standpoint of um, the law as well, um, that that training does not uh, just just to clear up any misconception. That that training is not just the the physical hands-on training that some might imagine. Um, it is it goes into depth into the constitutional law application. Um, of force, the use of force as well. Um, and that's trained in our academy through our legal staff, um, which moves into the practical application of the um, tactics and techniques through our uh, use of force uh, cadre. If I may mm -hmm. follow. Uh, you mentioned something, Captain, and, and maybe we have somebody I think you have your legal advisor here today. He is in the room. Okay. Uh, maybe speak to that, uh, what the uh, statutes and ordinances provide right now with regards to the authority for officers to use uh, use of force uh, and under what conditions. I think that, again, sometimes people uh, aren't clear on where those lines are drawn. Right. So maybe he can speak to that, or or you, whichever, whoever feels comfortable. And and I also want to interject in there, and I appreciate all the material that you gave us, but um, everybody else doesn't have it unless they go online. So what I would like for us to do is, I thought we would do like the purpose, the policy, the core values, kind of go through them, and so that's what city manager I would be looking for is is um, and and chief. Is, is kind of a presentation. I know I know there's going to be a lot of them um, and some key things, but um, I'm looking for you guys to educate us as well as the public um, so that we can go through these to see if there's something that needs to be changed, if there's something that's not up to date or, or whatever. And that's how I wanted to, I thought I made it clear that's how I wanted to spend my time. Okay. And correct me if you guys see differently, but this is going to be a long process, um, um, but but that's that's what you know. I, I want to make sure that we are on the same page, definition wise, you know, and procedure wise. Um, am I making sense? Oh, I think you are. And and and, 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 and we've got to. Um, I want you to tell me what I don't know. Because right now I can read this, but I want to make sure that I get a clear understanding. And for the viewers at home, I want to make sure that we get a clear understanding. And I think that would be helpful. Did you have something, Karen? Uh, I'm, I'm actively listening. I guess, and I, I, I don't know whether you want just sort of the textbook stuff at first. Obviously, for instance, in use of force, we've had a couple of cases that mm -hmm. were really mm -hmm. kind of classic examples, if you want to say that, recently. And so there are questions that people have about how, how both of those cases were handled in relation to your um, standard interaction policy as well as use of force and so on. So I don't know, uh, Madam Chair, whether you want those presentations to kind of touch on recent events or hold off and, and save that for questions. I think we'll eventually touch on that okay. sooner than probably later. Just, just checking and in I terms of presentation. I think that's why Mike wanted to start here. Mm -hmm. If that's, if that's, that's fine. Okay. 
Mike, did you have something else? No, that's fine. I, I okay. agree. And please identify yourself. I'm Mark Jones. I'm the police legal counsel. I've been here eight months. Uh, I thought just to help out, let me refer to, and, and you all have talked about 4.22, the policy, and this ties in directly to the issue of the law and what we teach about at the academy, beginning in the academy and in all of the training that we do. Okay. Uh, the police department, our policy is that we want our officers to use only the force that is reasonably necessary mm -hmm. to do whatever it is they need to do um, and to protect the lives of our citizens, to come home safe, and to also follow the law. That's, in a nutshell, that's what we ask people to do in the training. That's how we train them. Uh, I'm in the process of training at the academy right now. We're going to take up use of force in two days. We'll spend 12 hours on that, and we'll go through that just initially. Um, and there's other admonitions about that use of force that is included in our policy that is very uh, detailed. It says officers shall, shall, shall use advisements, warnings, verbal persuasion before using physical force. Before use physical force. And that's going to be subject to the circumstances, of course, but that's what we need to do. We also talk about, and this is on page two of our policy, and this is right out of how we teach them, we want physical force shall be de-escalated as resistance from the subject decreases. So that is a principle that we train with, that we reinforce, and we also want to have the officers have enough time to submit to arrest or comply with orders before physical force is used. So this is all part of the same policy. And lest we have a confusion about what that is, we talk about what deadly force is mm -hmm. and force. And deadly force, of course, any physical force which is likely to cause death or great bodily harm. That's what deadly force is. And so we have a policy on deadly force. We have policy on the use of force at all. And this ties into what we've talked about before. We have a use of force committee. We have uh, also a very robust and uh, detailed review of incidents that we go through. And we also have, and, and I see Ed is here today, our, uh, and he's an independent auditor of conduct. And, and he's recently published a report that he has done. So we have a number of people looking at it. But the part that we want to follow and the part that we need to follow is the law as given to us by the United States Supreme Court. And it's right here in our policy. It's Graham versus Connor. And we don't spend a lot of time, particularly in public meetings, talking about what the law is. But this is a major case that has been the law for a while. And it's what a lot of people have talked about nationally as we go through the various circumstances that we've seen in different cities. And it basically says, and this is an objectively reasonable standard, is that all officers shall use only the degree of force that is object objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. And when we talk about objectively reasonable, what the Supreme Court's talking about is two things. It's not the most rough and tumble police officer or Barney Fife with one bullet in his gun. It's the reasonably trained officer who is going to use this objective standard that we can all agree this is, this is, the, this is what a, police, a reasonably trained police officer is going to use. And here are the factors. They, they are called the Graham factors. And you'll hear that all over. There's, it's all over the news. Uh, every time there's a discussion about 
any uh, use of force or deadly force, there's gonna be this. It's gonna be, what was the severity of the crime? Whether the suspect posed an immediate threat to the safety of the officers or anybody else or others, and whether the suspect is actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight. So these are the three factors that the United States Supreme Court has applied in these kinds of use of force. And that is, this is all integrated into our training. It is integrated into our review process. It is integrated into our supervisory training. It's integrated into our uh, officers after they get out of the academy and uh, our field training officers also apply this. So there's a consistent issue of following the law because that's what we want to do. So what about reasonable circumstances, the kind of things which I think you wanna know about, what's the totality of the circumstances? What's going on? Um, and it has to be something that a reasonable officer would know about and the circumstances are gonna be based on what kind of case it is. It's gonna be based on the nature and extent of this person's resistance, or are they following commands, or are these commands reasonable under the circumstances? For example, if you're talking someone at a traffic stop where you talk to the person you go through, you check and see that they have a license, you do those things, and then when you're done, the stop is over, there's no need to use, you may issue a ticket or you may not issue a ticket, but you're done with that stop. There's no reason to use any other force, there's no reason for us to do anything else, and we actually go through the whole process of any stop, and well, what's reasonable suspicion, and does it rise to the level of what we call probable cause to arrest, or is it just a traffic stop? And so the severity of the crime makes a difference. Is it a felony car stop? Is someone wanted? What are they wanted for? Are they wanted for something relatively <coughs> innocent, relatively uh, a traffic ticket, or are they wanted for murder? And you can see how the amount of force necessary and the concern of the officers is gonna be based on what that person is wanted for, if they know. And then you look at the totality of the circumstances. How, you know, is this person uh, a small? Is this person uh, uh, cooperative? Are they saying they're cooperative? Are they really being cooperative? Those sorts of things. And what do we need to do to end the incident in a positive way or get the get this particular uh, stop done. Those are all those things. And we have a whole litany of training that we do and we have, and uh, you know, the, the police officers have a job to do and they need to do it. Mm -hmm. And, but how they do it, the use of force that they use to do it, that is generally what comes up. And that's why we have to have an objective standard and the Supreme Court has given us that. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's it. And if you have other questions, we can keep keep well, going. Okay, so we talked about the purpose on 42.1, and we talked about the policy, um, the purpose <coughs> on 42.1. Uh, the policy outlines the department's core values and rules relating to the use of force. And we talked a little bit about, about the policy. I, I have some questions. If, if we want to stop and ask some questions right now, um, I, I have a couple. Um, you said that we have a use of force uh, committee? We have a use of force group that reviews any use of force incidents inside the police department that is submitted to us. We have a use of force and on that use of force committee, that committee and what I'm talking about are those people, we have people who, uh, who teach hand-to-hand -hand uh, contact, uh, we have people who are in firearms and canines and all that who are very aware and have a lot of experience. And on that we have uh, captain, lieutenant, we have a variety of other, other people and we review 
this use of force. Now let me explain what use of force is because, because if someone takes out their weapon and they point their weapon, that is a use of force, whether they fire it, whether they do anything with it, because we want to be sure that we are following the law and following our training. If someone takes out a taser and points the taser at someone, that's a use of force. If someone goes hands-on, anybody, that's a use of force that needs to be reviewed. Whether it would, so if they were to put their hands on me, let's say I started to resist, but then I gave in, that would still be a use of force. If they put, if they put their, if they put their hands on you, that is a use of force. And it can be generated by a couple of different things. One, you could make a complaint about. But we're going to review it internally if it's a use of force within our policies and we've specified in our policies what we do and, and why we do it. Uh, if we use our dogs, we have canine unit, if we use our dogs, and remember a dog can be used as, in a sense, a weapon, right, if you release the dog, or it can use to get compliance, or it can be a sniff dog in a drug a case, something like that. So it's it's a form of use of force. Now, we don't generate a use of force if the dog goes around a vehicle that's suspected of drugs because it's not being used in that manner. But any sort of release of the dog, any sort of incident, any biting or holding incident, any of those things, that's a use of force that's going to be reviewed. Okay. Um, and then. Where does this apply for youth and mentally ill? Does it, is this a one, one thing fits all, or where does it apply to that? Where is the cutoff? Is there something totally different we're going to get into with that, or how does that work? Well, are you referring to interacting with people who are mentally ill or have had some sort mm -hmm. of problem? Mm -hmm. We actually have officers who are trained in in handling mental health individuals and interacting with them. Uh, we see a lot of people in Topeka and other, other cities do too uh, that are uh, homeless and homeless and having some issues. Mm -hmm. Or uh, we have people who are veterans. Mm -hmm. Many on the street are suffering from post-traumatic stress. And, and those sorts of things. So we reach out to, not only do we have individuals that are specifically trained, more likely than not, about these incidents, we also come across people um, uh, who have other beha behavioral incidents. For example, um, and I have uh, a niece who's suffering from uh, Osberger's syndrome, and she's high functioning, but she's definitely, the way she looks at things, the way she reacts to people, the way she, she reacts to power and authority is different than what you see in a lot of people. So we do train our officers about that. We have people who have specific skill sets and, uh, and we use them as much as we can, but it's often we don't always know what the circumstances are when we make a stop. And, and, and with all due respect, I, I can appreciate that, and I can appreciate our trained officers, but they're not going to be on every call that's made. Um, so that's why I want to know what, how are they trained? They show up, this person seems normal, but then the more you get to talking to them, and, and then anything can just trigger his anxiety or his post-traumatic stress or anything, you know, just really simple, and then they flip out. And so how, how are we handling that, or where does that fall in in this category? Well, I would say, and I'll let the captain talk about uh, as, a, as an officer who supervises people, but what I've observed in uh, every place that I've, ever, I've been, I've been four places, uh, you typically, when there's a use of force contact, you're going to contact your supervisor, and your supervisor is going to deploy the people that they need if, if they can to that circumstance. Uh, but I'll let the captain talk about because he's, he's dealing as a watch commander uh, about those different incidents all the time. 
So we, we talked about our, our unit, um, and we'll, we referred to Sergeant Clam um, as, as a resource, um, but, but, but you're right. That's, that's a small number of officers in that unit that we deploy um, when they're available, when possible, when we know those circumstances um, exist. But I, I think we need to step back um, to some of the fundamental training that all the officers uh, receive in the academy, um, in in-service, um, things of that nature. All of our officers uh, receive a 40-hour uh, block of crisis intervention training, okay. um, which is basically the basis of what Sergeant Clam's unit functions upon. Um, we receive de-escalation training. Um, we receive culture awareness training. We receive um, a, a healthy dose of tactical communication training. And I, I think that's an important one um, not to set aside or because or, we lean on that a lot. Mm -hmm. That teaches our officers um, tactics and, and techniques. And, and if you want to get right down to it, how do you talk to people? That's right. How do I successfully navigate uh, any type of call that's thrown in front of me? I don't, I don't always get to decide how that's going to go or the direction of it. But we can certainly use these trainings that I'm, I'm talking about to try to drive that in the, in the successful direction that we want it to go. Um, that plays into our ethics training too. Our officers receive um, almost from day one in the <coughs> academy uh, ethics training from our instructors in the academy. You can't just look at one uh, topic, the, the de-escalation training, uh, the cultural awareness training. It all rolls together when we're talking about that citizen contact and the officer trying to drive towards a successful uh, outcome. So uh, I, I think it's important that, that, that we look at that all of these um, kind of as a package deal, if you will. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. if yes, I, Councilman thank you, Bidia. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Captain. Um, and that's where I was gonna, what I was going to ask is because um, it's, it's a bonus to have uh, officers who are trained specifically to deal with that topic. But as been stated, they're not there for every call or every incident. And so it's important to understand how that's interwoven into the overall training of every officer on the street so that they are trained um, what I think is part of the first step is how to identify there you go. Uh, an issue that should click in their head and say, okay, now this, this has to kick in now because this is a situation that involves someone that needs specific communication um, that I'm going to have to uh, address them in, in uh, a way that will help this situation. And that's the thing that I think is important that we don't get so uh, compartmentalized that these guys are, are CIT people right. and they're the best and that's good, but the whole department has a clear understanding of what they will probably encounter at some time during their career and how to identify it how to respond, and if that is incorporated into all the training, how, how often is it revisited? Uh, because that's something that um, I think, like just every other skill that law enforcement officers have, has to be revisited, 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 so they become uh, keenly aware of those uh, situations that require them to take another step, another 
level of communication, another level of de-escalation if necessary. And so that's something that I uh, would ask, you know, how often is it revisited in that kind of training? Uh, uh, do, does the department also employ outside entities uh, for that training? Or does it uh, depend solely on internal training officers? Um, some, some of it is internal um, instructors, but they have received their, their train, the trainer, so to speak, from uh, outside training sources. So we, we, we send officers in, 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 in almost every area of law enforcement we have to outside trainers to be trained and receive that uh, trainer certification, um, if you will. Um, each year, uh, we are required to have 40 hours of uh, in-service training. And within that in-service um, training, there are um, required topics that have to be um, touched upon mm -hmm. um, every year. Um, to dig a little deeper into when, when we talk about um, topics like de-escalation, how often do we revisit uh, de-escalation. Um, well, as we mentioned in our first meeting, um, de-escalation is woven into so many <coughs> aspects of what we do that we regularly touch on um, communication and de-escalation tactics. Um, this is visited in our in-service training package uh, annually. Um, this is put into our defensive tactics training. Um, it, it's not just um, showing the efficiency of the technique on, on the map. It is actually um, uh, communicating, uh, giving clear, concise verbal commands. Um, then that goes to the range as well in our firearms training. Um, it's not just um, showing up at the range and showing efficiency um, and understanding and safety techniques with your firearm. Uh, it is um, verbal commands. We give challenge commands on the range. We look for compliance. Um, not every drill at the firing range results in uh, pulling the trigger uh, and, and firing at a target. Uh, we give verbal commands um, to gain compliance uh, on the range too. So uh, all of these things are re revisited um, throughout an officer's career uh, in different trainings that they receive, some <coughs> required, uh, some that they seek on their own, some training classes that they go to um, outside the agency. So uh, to, to answer the, the question, I think it's revisited on a very regular basis. That's, that's good to hear, uh, and if I may follow up. Um, and in doing that revisiting, like you suggest, uh, performance in other skills is rated or um, for proficiency. In an officer's evaluation, annual evaluation, is there an area that speaks directly to that so that let's say as a training FTO, a field training officer, if I'm riding with somebody and in this area I see uh, room for improvement or that they're doing well, is it specifically addressed in that overall officer's annual evaluation? Because I think that's another way to bring it to someone's attention if it has been noted by a supervisor or training officer or somebody that additional focus needs to be on that topic? Yes, it, our, our annual performance uh, evaluations do cover the topics in, in professionalism and, and the, the officer's overall um, ability to, to communicate um, not only with uh, coworkers, uh, uh, supervisors, but the public as well. And those things are addressed in, in uh, annual performance evaluations. Okay, well, I think that's important, I think, because um, that's part of the general conversations that we've been hearing, mm -hmm. is that uh, that it's an ongoing 
process of evaluation and review of uh, our proficiency in everything that law enforcement is tasked with. And sometimes I know from experience yes. that uh, too much focus is, is placed on just procedural pieces and not uh, the pieces that develop a person as an empathetic officer on the street, somebody who is able to see these things in the community, able to respond in an effective and appropriate way. So I, I, I appreciate you making that yeah. uh, an explanation and it's only a suggestion. Uh, I would kind of be interested in talking maybe with you or anybody offline about how that comes across then in an in a, in a annual evaluation. If a supervisor sees that, what actions do they take then to improve that performance level? Right, and, and to be clear, um, we do have an annual performance evaluation, but those things don't have to wait mm -hmm. for the annual performance uh, review with the officer. Um, every officer on the street has peers and, and supervisors. And if they notice, um, you know, hey, you're, you're doing a great job in the communication in, in, that, in that area, or you did great on that call or something, those things, those things are, are brought up. And those things are reinforced with, through positive reinforcement. It doesn't have to wait for the annual review. The flip side of that is also true. If the supervisor and or peers notice an officer maybe struggling in that area or lacking in their communication or their de-escalation um, uh, skills, that does not have to wait for the annual review um, to be brought forward. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's good to know. Are you done, Mr. Uh, go ahead. I wanted to ask a follow-up question on that very subject. And I realize I um, put you on the spot and you can decline if you want, but different departments and companies have different cultures in terms of how they score people on reviews you're raising really good points because really in a personnel review there should never be a surprise. Um, people should already be aware of any performance improvement kinds of things in a, in a review and in a perfect world should only be a documentation of that relationship. But there are places where there is creep, where people decide to be nice on the score so somebody will get their raise or whatever. Um, on Because I think the challenge that we have here is you have great policies and, and so on but the question on each one is, okay, is it playing out that way? And so, for instance, on a scale of one to 10, one low, 10 high, what would your assessment be of, of how spot on those personnel reviews are and those processes are to identify those opportunities for improvement and to nail it if, if it's not happening? So our performance, um, our performance evaluations are also backed up with quarterly feedbacks. So the supervisors set goals um, for the employee. Uh, the supervisor then uh, meets with that employee quarterly to go over those goals um, to see where they're at. And it's, it's, it's an ongoing kind of a living, breathing measurement, if you will, um, as, to, as to how that employee is doing on their goals, which then directly feeds into that performance evaluation. Now our performance evaluation, um, how spot on they are. Um, the supervisor uh, can't just throw out a, a, number. a number or, or a, a category or a rating or whatever you want to call it. <coughs> um, each area of our performance evaluation has to be responded to with comments, um, examples, uh, statistical information um, so you know on the uh, imagine if you will on the left side of the column here's here, here's the topics and here's what I'm being evaluated with and on the right side of the column the supervisor has to respond to each one of those areas with comments backing it up um, this is this is where we're, this is where I am coming from when I assign this rating to this employee and here are the examples and the comments and the numbers to back that up. Okay. I, I hope that. 
well, it and, up a little bit. I may be straying into something else, but the example that pops to mind right now is that in the in the two use of force instances that have gotten a lot of publicity lately, both in both sets of officers, the officers were quite comfortable in cursing at the um, the citizen. Yet that's a absolute violation. I, mean, I learned a lot reading these. I, I don't know that I got it all figured out, but it's an absolute violation of policy. And so, if it was never, it, you know, would that have automatically been written up, or does sometimes there's a culture creep in terms of what's okay, even though it's not really policy? There are there are things that are taken into consideration. I mean, if we're talking specifically about cursing. It's, it's an example that jumped out at me. Sure. Um, so there are things that are, are taken con into consideration into each um, incident or category or rating incident um, as well. But um, I, I think you have to go back further uh, than uh, just the performance evaluation when we talk that specific um, of an incident. Um, so when those things are captured in a, uh, a use of force scenario, uh, the review process, as our legal advisor uh, mentioned, is, and I don't want to overuse the word, but it's, it's accurate and true, is quite robust. Um, so the incident is reviewed from the first line supervisor all the way through the chain of command um, to our use of force review team, our independent uh, police auditor. Um, cursing specifically um, is in policy and in, against uh, policy in most most cases. But what uh, I think we have to look at the human factor and what is triggering that response? Is it is it uh, straight up fear um, from the officer um, as to what is playing out and? That is being that fear is being verbalized um, through a natural human reaction, or is the officer in a scenario where he's just straight up being rude? One may result in discipline, um, specifically for the topic of cursing. One may not. Um, depends on the set of circumstances. The as as the legal advisor said, the, the totality of the circumstances. Well, that kind of concerns me because, um, you know, if he's stressed and he's cussing at somebody, I mean, my, my half-brother was an officer. I've had officers and family members that were out there. I get it. I've done a ride along. I get it. I think I'd be tired of going to Johnny's house every, every Thursday, every time. You know, they get to know the area. I get it. But that's, that's part of what we expect out of them is to go and to be professional and to do, to do the right thing, you mm -hmm. know? And it's frustrating. So how do we measure when they get to that point? You know, I, I know every time we have a tragedy, I usually ask the chief or, you know, are our guys being, are they okay? Are they fearful when an officer's shot? Are they, do they need counseling? Are we giving them what they need? But how do we as, an agency, how do we look at that? You know, because some of the things that come out of their mouth is 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 just not. To me, it's 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 just not. It's not good. It's not excusable. Yes, Chief. So profanity is one of those things that we do take serious, and that is a policy that is enforced very often. Okay. okay? He sits on the chairman of the Use of Force Review Board, and I just sent a text message to our professional standards unit. But I can tell you profanity is one that is enforced. It is disciplined. It's disciplined quite often if it's used inappropriately. What I believe the captain was trying to convey to you, there are certain situations that you can put yourself in where it becomes a life or danger, life or death situation for yourself in your mind, that where profanity is used. And we review all those and we take that very seriously. But I can tell you, that is a policy that is enforced 
and enforced quite often if it's used inappropriately. Chief, I appreciate that. Um, is there so many, so, so let's say Johnny got wrote up for it this time. Next time, you know, you kind of looked at it. So if we're seeing that pattern, do we do something with him? Yes, there's, there's progressive discipline. And, and like I said, when corrective action takes place, corrective action takes place. Now, you know, uh, progressive discipline, the first one's a, uh, verbal counseling, it's a written form, and then it's a written warning, and then there's suspension and all that other stuff, uh, up all the way up to determination. Progressive discipline takes place. What I can tell you most of the time, when an officer gets disciplined for a policy, corrective action takes place, they don't repeat it. That's the norm. So, you know, we have not terminated anybody for use of profanity in the 34 years that I've been on. But I can tell you, within the last three years, it's definitely a policy that has been uh, adhered to, or we try to adhere to it the best we can, and when it's not done correctly, or it's done outside of policy, disciplinary corrective action does take place. Okay. Karen, are you okay with that? Are we ready? Do you want to, you have something else? Well, oh. I have a lot of questions, but it was just a, just a, an example for the review one, so we can. can well, I, I think the most important thing we talked about some of these things is, uh, as the captain said, you have the human element. You cannot remove the human element out of certain situations. Mm -hmm. You just cannot do it. No matter what you train, no matter what you do, no matter what you educate, there is still the human element. And we're dealing with human beings when we're utilizing these circumstances. And most of the time when use of force is utilized, it is individuals that don't want to go to jail. Yeah. And I understand that, Chief. I mean, believe it or not, I'm a hothead and I've had to learn how to deal with that and to deal with the public and to take a deep breath and I've had to use my coping skills and I see young people that were teaching them their coping skills but one little word can take them, just be a trigger and take them back where our officers should be very respectful for that. So I, I understand what, they are human, but, but the, the flip side of that is we're human too, so we've, we've got to get that, get that balance in there. Oh, trust me, I understand, and that's why we spend so much time on these things. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not taken lightly. Okay. Uh, but at the end of the day, some things will still happen. I mean, and that's why you have corrective action if it needs to take place. Okay. Karen, did you have more? Well, I, I don't know if, if it's appropriate to take those two more recent cases. I, I mean, neither of them seemed very threatening or violent to me, yet both individuals got taken down, both individuals got cursed at, and I had a hard time figuring out why. Well, I mean, the I, thing... I, I represent District 1. I've got some, some people that I've had repeat experience with, and part of it, it can be one of the questions I had was, you know, is, is prior knowledge something you train about? Because if, if the officers already know the individual, then, you know, to me, every day should be a new day. <laughs> When, and, I, and that's what I read in the policies in terms of approaching someone with respect and an opportunity for a situation to go well. And so um, I, I just, I couldn't see it. I, I have questions related that, with those in mind about just the, the review processes too. I, I think I, I, learned, I learned a lot more than I knew and I think I understand. For instance, the use of force team is only looking at the incident. The issue of the personnel review, the best I read about it, rests with that immediate supervisor and then it goes up through the entire chain of command to the chief, but everybody is simply reviewing what that immediate supervisor's analysis was and what they thought should be done. And then even the um, professional standards group is just reviewing what that supervisor? That's not correct. Okay, I, I That's need not some correct. clarification to that. No, at each level, each commander, each supervisor is to review the entire <coughs> packet that is attached. 
not just the frontline supervisor that responds to the scene. They review the entire situation. They review the videos, they review the reports, they review everything. They also review the comments made by the immediate supervisor. The lieutenant does, then the captain reviews what the lieutenant and the sergeant says, and the major reviews what the captain and lieutenant as well as the entire package. So, one of the things, if you remember back on, before August 25th, I can't remember what day it was, that we spent four days going, or four hours going over policy at a city council meeting. One of the things that I said, a lot of corrective action takes place as a result of a use of force, but may, may not be the use of force because it's within policy. This is the things that we're talking about when we talk about profanity and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's, and then when you talk about the two specific cases recently, it's personnel issues at that point when action is taken. And but, so- But should we be talking about those, uh, is it one under legal? Both of them are under legal? So we shouldn't be talking about those cases, am I correct? Right, so? but I'm just saying those are cases okay. where those, those circumstances come into play. You mm -hmm. know, there's things that are going on. And so, you know, I, I, like I said, I'll, I'll get the numbers for you and all that other stuff, but there's a lot of defensive actions that take place or use of forces that take place where there are cursory issues that are corrected. I guess I'm trying to understand how, how the system works in that it appeared on, um, again, the only two examples I have seen are the two recent incidents that I'm referring to where we actually got an IPA report. So it was the first time I've seen the, the deep dive into how, how a case works and then, and then reading the manual, it, it appeared from the manual that, Something I always wondered was why it had to go through five people and a committee. <laughs> and if anything changed, typically from, and that's more from a budget point of view, <laughs> but, well, the main but if anything difference. changed typically, and I thought what I read was that the supervisor got called at the time the incident occurred and actually showed up on site, if possible, and made their own assessment at the time and then made a decision, made an assessment of the situation, took whatever action, if any, that they thought was appropriate with that individual officer or the team of officers, wrote up their report, and then that report went through the sequence of reviews all the way up to the top, and then, um, I, I can't remember now at what point, it, it, it has to go through all the reviews before it goes to the IPA, I'm not sure who it, whether it goes to that professional standards committee before it comes to you or not, but there are a lot of eyes on things. I wasn't sure based on the in, internal auditor's report whether, whether that progression of reports that he saw actually included what the personnel action was because in one of them, uh, the second one, I think the first one didn't really suggest any particular actions. The second one suggested there should be a couple of personnel related actions. And I didn't know whether that had come all the way up or whether that was the first time those actions had been suggested, you know, from the IPA's report. So, it, you know, I, cause I think what a lot of the concern that citizens are raising is, are the, okay, the standards are in the book. At what point did people make sure that they're being carried out that way? And how, what does it take, you know, where does it, where is it addressed along the way for sure? It's addressed along the way at every step okay. because the entire packet is reviewed, not just the supervisor's review because then that wouldn't be an adequate review of the situ situation. It goes through the chain. The main thing that the chain of command is looking at is there anything violation of policy. That's the main thing that they're looking at. What the use of force review board really looks at is, okay, after it's gone through that review, is there training things that we need to be aware of? Is there corrective action in the aspect, do, does this officer need remedial training? Uh, uh, do we need to change something in the training program? Is there something that needs to be changed from legal's perspective or whatever? The use of force review board is reviewing it in the aspects of, okay, what type of 
not to render corrective action. It's to render right. whether there is something that needs to be changed in the training protocol or does this individual officer need some individual remedial training and stuff like that. That's what makes the independent police auditor one of the best things that we have because it's independent. He gave his opinion on what additional training may take place or needs to be taking place. That doesn't mean we haven't already identified it or recognized it or whatever, but that's what makes that so good. And when you talk about, well, you've only seen two reports, you gotta also understand we're right now right out a year with the independent police auditor and so there's, there's things that, gotta, that are being worked through. And so what's the expectations? I'm not complaining. It's just that's my frame of reference. No, and that's why I'm pointing it out. And that's just like, you know, the IPA is going to get it after it goes through the process. It's just like if we decide, if we decide that we're going to have a citizen review board, that's going to be the same process. Citizen review board's going to get it five, six, seven, eight weeks after the incident took place. They're not going to get it right off because that's not how it works. It's got to go through its processes. If I can ask one more mm -hmm. question about is is the idea of reviewing whether the policy is a good policy part of the charge of the uh, review board? The policy uh, is basically the chain of command responsibility. Okay. And so that's one of the things we look at. Does policy need to be changed? Is this uh, what we're doing fit? What needs to fit? and does it need to be changed and then we review it. Our policies are reviewed constantly. That's part of the CLIA process and the, that we have. And we have somebody that reviews policy constantly. Um, and policies are set up on a rotating basis on which ones get reviewed, you know, this year, next year, whatever. But uh, there's a standard that says they have to be reviewed within so many years each time and our, that's what our policies go through. But that doesn't mean we can't change them or make an adjustment to it because we're actually looking at wording change and verbiage change. We've already did on some policies uh, here recently and so we're looking at some more. Thanks, and, and forgive my questions. We're, we're being challenged about whether our policy is okay or the administration of policy is okay. So yeah. I'm just doing my best to figure out what, what's happening. No, and these are the conversations we need to have. Uh, right. You know, I don't mean to be defensive, but I think we have a very good policy. I think we got a very good process in place. Um, the thing we got to understand at the end of the day, some people go to jail, don't want to go to jail. And force is used to make sure that that takes place. Compliance is, is the main reason. Use of force is not to punish. Use of force is to get compliance. And that's why you stop the force when you've achieved compliance. can't ask more questions about the only two cases I know a whole lot about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Unfortunately. Mike, if I may, thank you. Padilla, yes. sure. Chief, I don't know if you want to answer this or um, maybe legal advisor. <clears throat> I'm familiar with everything you've talked about and how things work out. I, uh, and I agree with your comment that the IPA position is uh, one of the best things that uh, the city has come up with. Um, and I want to say it clearly like that because there are some people who still believe the IPA is the police department's employee and that's not the case. That is an independent position uh, reporting directly to the city manager. Uh, but I want to ask about one thing and I hope this doesn't stir up the hornet's nest. <laughs> Uh, on the uh, use of force committee, I remember from my experience, typically what the makeup was of the people on that committee. Has, has any thought ever been given to include a non-police person, a civilian, in that use of force committee with that group of professionals? I'm glad you asked that because uh, actually one of the things that when I became the chief, that's one of the things that I wanted to do was include some uh, citizen involvement in that process. Uh, that's just one of the things that we haven't able, been able to get to uh, with all the parties involved. How do we make that work and what's that look like? Um, you know, because again, you start 
dealing with some personnel issues and stuff stuff like that. But uh, I, I, I think that's something that uh, if we get the parties together and we sit down and talk and figure out, you know, what that might look like, how can we make that work? Um, but that was something that, you know, uh, I'd started that conversation and um, it's, uh, it's kind of a sticky wicket when we talk about, you know, you talk about starting a hornet's nest, I call it sticky wicket, however we want to phrase it. It's uh, one of those things, but I do think it's one of those that could have benefit. Um, and again, it's, you know, finding how we would uh, involve that, how we would mold it to where it works, to where um, we have confidentiality and stuff like that. Um, because you know, you, you, you're, uh, you're privy to stuff that normal citizens aren't privy to, but yet it's also important information that citizens probably need to understand, or if that makes sense. Um, but it's definitely something that I, you know, a process that we could look at. It's just how we would uh, figure that out, you know, and legal would really have to be involved with that and that figuring out what that looks like. I understand, I'm, I'm glad that you entertained the thought. I understand the difficulties that would be presented with regards to first, how do you select someone? What would be the qualifications for that person to sit? Um, and again, how do you protect the um, information? How do you keep the confidentiality intact? Um, and yeah, and I think that was, you know, one of the things when uh, I went through the process and one of the main conversations I had with the city manager at that time was that independent police auditor because to me that was uh, kind of a way that we could kind of interject that somewhat and the, the city manager um, took that, you know, took that understanding and took that under advisement and, you know, eventually we got the position implemented and I say we as the city, not the police department. Um, and that's why I said it's really a great thing because we really do have somebody that is a citizen and not part of the police department. Uh, having privy information that most people can't have and being able to make decisions. And again, when we talk about it, it's uh, the first one in the state of Kansas, one of the few in the United States. So it's really kind of cutting edge thinking in that process. And so we just have to evolve it to where it needs to be and where it needs to get. Uh, but again, that's somebody outside the police department, as you know, that has access to that information that has direct contact with the city manager. And you know, like I said, the city manager, when he made that decision that this was a, a position we needed, that was that was a big thing, I think, for the city of Topeka and the citizens. And again, uh, you know, some of the comments are, you know, it's a paid city employee or it can't be independent. Well, yeah, it can. I mean, um, just how we make it work that way, a little better. Thank you. Along, the, along those lines, and I, I don't know who can answer this question, but we had a group um, advocating that they, they wanted uh, citizen involvement in the hiring process as well. And, and you know, a lot of this process that we're going through is educational for us, but also the citizens. And, and I looked at that and I thought, well, we have a civil service board now, but maybe most people in the public don't know. And those individuals are not law enforcement people. They're involved mm. in the hiring and and obviously would have to be confidential and so on and the civil service board works okay doesn't it yeah the civil service board's a great thing and it, like you said it is a, a board of citizens that uh, have nothing to do with the police department and as a matter of fact this year um, they changed the questions because they've been the same questions as when i came on in 87 i think uh, but the questions are geared now more towards uh, current events and what's going on currently right now um, and some of those questions are uncomfortable questions that they ask the police applicants. Um, but yeah, the Civil Service Board is, is, it works very, very efficiently. It works very well. Uh, and again, you know, yeah, they, they have to sign confidentiality and all that other stuff. So that's what I think that's there where There might be some protocols to look at is what yeah. I'm thinking there if you wanted to, we, that we wouldn't even have to reinvent if you wanted to add. Yeah, so. yeah, and that's one of the, the, uh, the, the things that, uh, we could look at, like I said, there, I think there, there's the opportunity, there's a chance, but again, it's gonna be one of those things we have to really look at and how do we, how do we make that work. Uh, I feel uh, very confident that those that 
said on the civil service board, uh, keep things confidential, because that's they get to do what they get to do, and right. uh, you know, and maybe that's maybe that's the venue in which you know one of those individuals that's already you know shown that they can be trusted and confidentiality and all that. That maybe you know that's maybe that's another role for them, or at least that that model for vetting who gets on the board in the first place and what they're whatever they have to sign and display. Okay, um, I, I, um, I don't feel like my question was answered um, with the youth. Chief, do you want to answer that? What was the question? Um, if, if the officers are called to a house, uh, do they treat a youth the same as they would an adult? Or do they treat them differently uh, with use of force? Um, how, how does that work? Well, <clears throat> the, yeah, for the most part, when an officer responds to a call, there's a kind of a standard process in which they go through that call initially. Um, do you guys have the juvenile uh, policy? Do we? I don't think that's don't one think that so. I. Okay. okay, that's one we need to get you because that has a lot of information on how they deal with juveniles and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is there is supposed to be uh, there is some different protocol when you deal right. with a doll as opposed to juvenile. Um, but it's also like when we respond to a behavior health call, the first thing is you got to secure the scene, then you can start work on getting services. And so there are times that, um, you know, on a behavior health call, you may not know that there's, there's circumstances that exist. But with a juvenile, yeah, there are certain protocols and calls are handled a little bit different. Uh, but the initial responses are usually all the same and then until you figure out those. If we, could, if we could get that for our next meeting and then we'll come back to that. The other thing is, um, you talked about 40 hours of crisis. Is that per year? Yeah, no, the CIT is a basic 40 hour certification course that every officer goes through. And if you, that sheet I handed out is what our in service is this year. And if you look, there's some behavior health uh, training that we'll be hitting on. And so it's, um, the 40-hour course is a basic certification course on how to deal with individuals who are in a behavioral health crisis. And uh, <coughs> when we talk about those continuing hours, that's where we do the continuing education training. And as you see, there's a segment for that in this block. So is this um, mandatory? Yes, every officer on the department must attend this training. Okay. ABLE is the active bystander for law enforcement that's at information that I've been sending out uh, that we're one of 30 agencies in the United States that was picked to uh, be involved in that program. Okay. And that's the uh, intervention uh, by fellow police officers. Do, um, okay, okay. Um, and then the next thing I think I had Okay, are we ready to move on from, from just that use of force or um, from policy, use of force from policy 4.2? Or do we want to talk about, well, it talks about de-escalation. I don't think we got into that. Let's start there, if we may. And that's on page three, 4.2.5. And, and Chair, yes, um, it, it's okay with me to move on, but I think at some point they did provide us the 2017 and 2018 use of force reports, and they do show disparate numbers of minorities, and so at some point I think we should get back to that. Okay, we can. Okay. Go ahead. So contained in the use of force, um, policy there is a section on de-escalation 4.2.5 um, short of um, reading the entire thing but um, if you look at just section a there de-escalation tactics and techniques are actions used by officers when safe and without compromising law enforcement priorities that seek to minimize the likelihood of the need to use force during an incident and increases the likelihood of voluntary compliance. So um, as we, I think we talked um, 
earlier about the de-escalation training that um, each officer receives uh, in the academy, um, not only um, in the, the standalone format, um, but through those other uh, topics that I talked about. Um, and as, as you see, that that's revisited um, in our in-service uh, package. Um, but just to reemphasize that this, that this de-escalation that, that is, is built in to um, so many aspects of what we do, reinforced into so many different aspects of what the officers do, not only in training, but on a da daily basis in that review process that we talked about, um, that through every um, layer of uh, the chain of command, um, when we talk specifically um, about use of force. Um, we talked a little bit, um, and it kind of bleeds into your question, um, I think a little bit about the uh, mentally, um, mental impairment, mm -hmm. um, juveniles and things like that, if we skip down um, to D, some of that is addressed um, within this policy under de-escalation. So, um, when time and circumstances reasonably permit, officers shall consider, officers shall consider whether a subject's lack of compliance is a deliberate attempt to resist or an inability to comply based on factors including, but not limited to, medical conditions, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug interaction, and or behavioral crisis. Okay. So those, those are, uh, you know, specifically outlined in policy, um, s some bullet points, if you will, that we um, consider during these types of, um, encounters what what is the root cause of what's going on here um, as, as the chief said there are some some folks that just don't want to go to jail and, and, and they're willing to um, be physical um, to try to stop that from happening um, but there are other things that we have to consider is, is this person able to understand what I am trying to to communicate to them? Is there some limitations there as to why they aren't understanding uh, what's going on? And, and th these things are, uh, these considerations are trained to our officers to try to recognize what's going on. If, if something's not working, try something else. I don't know how many, you know, I've, I used to be involved in training more than I am now. Um, the, the chief would laugh at me, but I'm kind of starting to be, become that older uh, officer, I, I knew I would get a chuckle from across the room on that. Um, uh, but I don't know how many times I said that um, to recruits. If something's not working, try something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what some of these um, topics in here uh, emphasize to the officers that they need to recognize when it's time to try something else and why. Why isn't this person responding the way I think they should be responding to my clear, concise, verbal commands? Um, is it that they don't want to understand me or they can't understand me? That, that, that's just one example um, I guess I would uh, provide. Um, but I, I do think um, I guess it's safe to say that I'm, I'm proud of that section in our in our policy. I, I taught uh, de-escalation back when de-escalation wasn't really the buzzword, um, so to speak. I, I, I created a, an eight-hour course for our um, recruits, uh, and I also created a shorter version of that for uh, annual in-service package, and this was Six, six years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Now, since then, our, you know, the department has adopted outside training and an actual uh, formal de-escalation training. Um, but the nuts and bolts of what's in this policy 
has been in place in this agency longer than I've been here. Um, this is this is what this is what law enforcement officers do. They try to de-escalate things, and they try to understand why. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I guess I'm veering off course here, but I'm proud of this this section that's in in the policy. I think it's important that it's in there. No, we need to hear that. I need to hear that. Hmm? Like we need to hear that. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the chief mentioned something, and so did you. I just kind of want to follow up on it. Uh, it's been, I've read on either emails or posts that, that uh, when officers show up complaining about officers' presence, that show up and right off the bat they want to take charge and not listen to people. Looking at this policy, it seems like at least in the training aspect, that's contrary to what you're training, is that listening is the first step in the de-escalation part. The one thing that I think that sometimes gets overlooked at uh, is that in many cases, those situations are a little chaotic. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to talk at the same time. Everybody wants you to do this, and the other guy wants you to do that. So at some point, somebody has to take control. And that is why officers are called, because it's a situation that is getting out of hand, and if not addressed, people could get harmed. And so I think that sometimes that's forgotten, that the first step is to make sure that people are put in a position where they can be heard, but they can only be heard if they give that officer the opportunity. And so the de-escalation of sir or ma'am, just give me a second, let me, let me talk to this individual, I'll talk to you, or if you have enough officers, then you separate them, get the stories, do those kinds of things. Uh, it's been implied that the very presence of officers adds to uh, a situation. And from what I see here, I think you're, what I see is the training is designed to do just the opposite, but to come to a situation that we recognize uh, is uh, maybe a little out of control and to bring some calm uh, to that situation so that uh, the real issues can be addressed. And uh, for me, I think that uh, that's why I think this process is helpful. Um, assumptions that you come in and just want to take control uh, are being uh, mischaracterized as just want to push your way around. And I believe control is first the first step in getting people to listen to each other and listen to you and getting that compliance that you're, you're wanting to get without the use of force. So, uh, yeah, and I, I may add, we don't want to forget um, a part of de escalation is trying to stop a, this behavior that's already out of control before it spirals beyond a, a, a point that we can reel it back in or. Or, or things are or going to get really out of hand, um, and maybe a, maybe a um, a situation where a, a, a very low level empty hand control tactic might might have gotten someone detained and in, in, in handcuffs, and if 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 we don't recognize where we're at and we step in and try to try to dial that situation back, and sometimes that is with that that officer presence. Um, I have to show up in a situation that is getting out of control and I have to show that I can be in control and that we, we, can, we can stop this from escalating right here with the, the right level of um, presence, professionalism, 
or in some cases a, a very low level um, use of force before it rises to the level um, above and beyond that. So um, a, a piece of de-escalation can be, this sounds odd, but a low level of force. If that, does that make sense? I, I hope I'm explaining that. Yeah, I don't know. I think so. I think, uh, again, I think it's been addressed and the chief said something about it. How you approach that situation, how you walk up to the people and how you present yourself to them. If you do it in a professional way, hopefully they'll respond more likely than in an abusive way Correct. or making assumptions about the people that are already upset, uh, maybe cursing, you know, maybe using the words you shouldn't use to calm a situation. But I think that how you approach that says a lot about an officer's training and personal character and how they address people, uh, whether they're young, uh, middle-aged, old, professionals, uh, homeless, how you approach them, uh, how you make them feel when you get there. Right. Uh, that they You're want you there, not afraid of you or they're, they're not gonna resist you or fight you. But that really, that tone gets set too by that officer that shows up. Yes, it can. Yes, Karen. Councilwoman. I agree with what he, he just said in that, I guess for me, the goal is that everybody's glad to see an officer arrive because we have faith that they're gonna, that the situation will be under control. Um, I don't know if you're going to want to answer this question, but I have a fair, people call their council person when they're upset, right? So I don't, I can't claim that my experiences are what, what percentage of the interactions my constituents and others who call me have, but I, I have had a fair amount of experience of reports of escalation instead of de-escalation or prior knowledge. Um, getting in the way of, 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 um, of a situation. And this is not out of balance racially in this case. I'm thinking of people of color as well as, as white. Um, even constituents that ended up in jail, you know, because they got upset when their code compliance came out to pick up their stuff because they hadn't got rid of it. And, and those, those trouble me. Um, would you, what would you, I, I appreciate your training and your manner, and I've certainly had experience with many officers on the force that have a great manner. What would, if you could venture a percentage of what percent of your officers, our officers, are really exemplary and totally reliable in being able to walk in and de-escalate a situation versus ones that need some work? I don't think I could venture a percentage of of exactly what you're um, what you're looking for there. Okay. What what I what I can say is that that all of our officers are trained <coughs> in the same manner. All of our officers receive the same skills, the same tools in their in their in their tool belt. Um, all officers um, read, understand, and agree with um, the mission and values of, of this agency. Um, and I, I, would, I would like to venture to say that, that all officers are um, trying to achieve that goal that goes in line with our mission and our values. I would too. I do think somehow we need to be able to talk in this committee. Um, I mean, when those things happen, there isn't always a complaint filed. There isn't always a supervisory intervention. It happens on the street um, and people don't, people talk about it or they don't forget. Um, so I, I, I knew it wouldn't be a, a data driven answer right. for sure. Um, but we, there have been experiences that way, and again, I don't want to be critical. We just want to fix it, and we need to know for sure that that where there are weaknesses, it's acknowledged, and that that we're really working on making it better. 
Right, and, and I, think, I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that I'm, not, I'm not sitting over here um, saying that, that we don't receive the same information where um, citizens may be unsatisfied with the level of service that they received on a, a particular call. Um, but that is the constant change that, that we strive for. So is that a, is that a, a, a training issue that, that need, are, are we seeing a trend? Is there a training issue that can be identified and addressed um, through this type of interaction? Are we seeing a number of them? Um, is it, a, is it a clear policy violation of something that's already in place and that can be addressed as the chief uh, talked about through the, the progressive discipline? Um, are these uh, maybe goals that we talked about earlier, the quarterly goals and that performance evaluation, um, if we have uh, an officer that we receive one or two um, notices of, of that type of, uh, you know, I'm not satisfied uh, with the level of service I received. Um, can that be a combination of things? Maybe mm -hmm. it's suitable for discipline. Maybe that's a new quarterly goal um, to work on communication skills. Maybe that's a remedial training issue. Um, these are all things um, that can be looked at, for, but, but I don't think I can sit over here and assign a percentage to who I think is exemplary or not. I think we all do a outstanding um, overall job in that area. And I think you know and where I I'm going. That's I'm the answer you'd expect to, me to say. To but I, I mean, and, and I there's mean, always going to be new people and sure. always, always unexpected circumstances. I don't know enough to know how to, how to rate it, if you will, or, or how it's changed. Mm -hmm. But I know it happens. And, and that saddens me. And so you know, I think our, our task here is to understand those facts and figure out if there's any, again, recommendations that we could, that, that we could make that would make a difference in policy or administrative procedures or training and just to try and understand the facts or, you know, doing, doing our best, my best, I should say. So. Yeah, no, and I, like I said. I don't know what you would expect, maybe a little profiling, or profiling is the wrong word, but how things have changed in maybe the last five or 10 years since you've been in the roles that you've been in is, is the training pretty much the same Has it changed is there more no I, I performance the same no I, I think our, our training constantly evolves um, our training is always searching to achieve the goal of best practices of uh, achieving the highest level of professionalism that we can possibly uh, obtain attain through um, through that training, um, through the examples set by our supervisors and command, st uh, command staff, the expectations um, of those supervisors have to be clear and communicated. Um, but we are we are constantly changing and evolving. Uh, we th this agency I, I can say that from 21 years of being here this this agency is not stagnant. Yes, city manager, I'd like um, to add to that. I'd like to add just a couple of things Thank related you. to that. I think one thing that we need to pay attention to is that the police department and police officers are held to a much higher standard than other employees mm -hmm. related to mm -hmm. their performance and the period of time that they have to prove their performance that they're ready to be a long-term employee of the city from the standpoint that they have the longest probation period of any person that works here. They are constantly evaluated by numerous field training officers to ensure that they're fit for duty and ready to go and be released on their own. Um, we have, in my time, I think I would think we've had at least two, maybe three officers that have not made it through that period of time based on the evaluations of those officers and we have let them go because they do not fit the model of expectation that we have for our officers. And so that's something that Jamie and all of the people that are out there training and the chief uh, are, are hitting pretty hard. I think the other thing is, is that um, with the independent police auditor, when he's evaluating use of force, he's evaluating 
evaluating other things as well, some of those policy violations, mm -hmm. to ensure, now, as Chief said, they may have already dealt with the issue well before it comes to the police auditor. But I think that's been a, in my mind, a bonus that I didn't look at when it came to the establishment of that position was that not only would we be evaluating whether the appropriate force was used, we'd be evaluating the character and performance of our officers in very tense situations to determine whether or not they're performing appropriately and whether there needs to be additional training uh, uh, for that officer. And what we may even identify um, and it's happened where we identified, or I should say Ed has identified a situation that required some additional training and looking at our policies as they relate to new law and so forth. So I think those are important factors that I consider as we go look at our, our training and the, what we do with our officers and, and the expectations that we have of our officers. And what I've noticed is the independent um, auditor has pointed out this is a uh, violation of this that or the other and just just a few reports that I've you know he's also pointed out to them something they might have missed right and and um, and just I've only read a few of them um, and, but and, and I think that's I think it's a double double cross you know yeah, it's a double review, check. extra yeah. review yeah and I think too those he's evaluating every one of those right. when they come through right and, and that's really what i want which is an opportunity for that to have a second set of eyes so that if there was something that occurred um, that may not have been reviewed in the right lens as an officer right. it may have been okay based on their policies but as a citizen we might consider that to be something that needs to be looked at and and further right well, and thanks for that point because the issue, you know, citizens have been have had concerns. They've raised those concerns. We all know that. And then when it comes back that the, the behavior was in accordance with policy, and if the citizen or whoever is still going, really, that's why we're here. In terms right. Of, Understood. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. If we could, um, I kind of overstepped my bounds. I seen that there. Um, go into escalation. <laughs> I didn't follow my own agenda. <laughs> so we de-escalated the situation. Now we're going to escalate it. Might need you to come back, Padi, on this one. So I, I think uh, I guess we can look at that in in in, in two ways, and we. Uh, I don't know how we talk about that without jumping um, into what I think we decided would be in later meetings with um, duty to intervene um, and today. things like that. Is that well? If we want to, then let's let's stop there and then we'll go back to B standard um, interaction and bias profiling. If if, if everybody's okay with uh, use of force. If we want to move on to B, or do we have anything? I think these are so interrelated. I felt like as long as we loop through the front okay. door. Okay. Let's go back to B. Let's let's go back okay. to B. Uh, we'll, Councilwoman, uh -huh. if I could, uh, I want to put this out real quick for the use of force part. We have our recertification for our defensive tactics instructor. The uh, company that does our defensive tactics training will be here December seventh through mm -hmm. the eleventh. Mm -hmm. And I want to open that up to the committee uh, members here. You're welcome to come to any of that training that you want to come to and view that, take part at it. Uh, you can let some of the officers use force on you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or you can use force on some of the officers. But you're welcome to attend any part of that training. Uh, we can get you the, the schedule and all that other stuff, but it's December 7th through the 11th. If you'll give that to Liz, that'd be great. I don't know if I'll go because they might be mad at me for sitting here so long. Two years <laughs> I cut their budget or didn't. So. And, and we will open that up to the other council members as well. I'll be getting that out, but I want to make sure that okay. you guys uh, got that. Appreciate that. Okay. Uh, let's start with standard interaction and bias profiling. So our, I guess I can maybe run through um, 
how a, a typical um, call for service uh, unfolds. And I may loop back a little bit um, to the uh, de-escalation training that I that I spoke about um, earlier that I, I put together um, a few years ago because we're going to talk about decision making. Can you tell me uh, where you're at, please? Uh, so I sent uh, the policy on patrol function 4.3. Thank you. So um, a, a standard a call for service, uh, I think everybody's aware, uh, initiates um, through either an emergency or non-emergency call to the Shawnee County Communications Center. Um, the dispatcher will gather um, pertinent information to the call, depending on um, you know what what the type of call is. We could we mm -hmm. could pick a type of call maybe and go through um, an example, but. Um, like a, a, a domestic dispute, for example. Uh, the dispatcher is, is gonna collect information from the caller. Um, what, what, is, what is the scenario? Where is it taking place? Who is involved? Um, hopefully how many uh, people are involved, descriptions of the people um, involved, um, and if there are any weapons involved, at least if they're aware of, um, and things like that. that <coughs> That information is taken from the call taker to the dispatcher and then relayed um, to the, the officer that will be responding. So now we jump into um, what I spoke about earlier with the decision making part um, of the de-escalation training that I, that I put on um, and it goes, it plays into everything the officers do. The officers are starving for information when a call comes out like that. The, the dispatchers do a fantastic job of providing as much information as they can, but the more information that the officer um, goes into a scenario with, um, hopefully they're making better decisions up front on who is involved, what is involved, what are the risks um, that, that uh, may be in place, um, and, the, and these things are happening before the officer arrives. These are, uh, this is part of that pre-arrival decision making, if you will. And what resources do I need? That is a big uh, part of this standard um, interaction or patrol function. What resources may I need? And another question that we like to ask is, am I the best person for the job? So um, we talked about all of our officers having the CIT uh, crisis intervention training. We talked specifically about the um, Sergeant Clams unit. So using that as an example, am I the best person for that job? If the um, officer's being dispatched to a call where um, they know ahead of time there may be a uh, crisis that's in, uh, being um, induced by some sort of uh, mental health issue or behavioral health issue, um, then the officer has that opportunity to make that decision if, for example, Sergeant Clam's unit's available and I, I start to gather the appropriate resources uh, to increase my chances for the greatest success on that call. So that's, that's one example of, of the decision making and the resource gathering that occurs um, in the officer's decision making process before they even arrive uh, at the call. Now we go back to um, what we were talking about earlier with uh, uh, communication and we, I think Councilman Padilla talked about listening um, and I take it a step further um, and I talk about active listening and that is going to begin the minute the officer steps out of his car. The minute <coughs> that officer has the ability to start gathering information or intelligence if you will as to what's going on. Um, the officer 
can gather that information on their approach to the house. What am I hearing? What am I seeing? Uh, what are the neighbors saying? What are the neighbors pointing out? We're still gathering information and in, in a decision-making uh, process. Mm -hmm. And all of that information then is being processed by the officer or officers or officers and supervisor or officers and supervisor and specialty units um, that are responding uh, to that call to increase the greatest likelihood of success on that call. Um, so th those are just some examples of a, uh, what's going on from time of dispatch to time of arrival and the decision making on a, a standard interaction or a standard call um, for service. Now once uh, contact is made, that, that intelligence gathering uh, process uh, doesn't stop. Um, as we talked earlier, um, as, I, as the officer begins to communicate on that standard interaction, what, what is taking place? We need to decide quickly, has, has the crime even occurred? Um, because that takes us down a different, different path in our decision-making process. Um, is my communication being successful with that person? If so, if not, why not? Um, as I said earlier, if something's not working, I need to try something else. Um, so all of these are factors that are going into our, our, our standard uh, call for service, our standard interaction. What, what, what holes can I, what holes can I fill in? What, what questions do you have? Maya. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Captain, I think you hit on a couple of things that I think uh, would help for the community. Uh, you enumerated a number of resource gathering activities that the dispatcher or officers um, start once they get a call you know start thinking through well, when i get there what's going to um, am i going to a domestic violence call uh, how many people are, the, are involved are there children there is there a weapon involved all those kinds of things like you said they're starving for information wanting to know that before they get there so they can at least step out of the car with some some understanding of what they're walking into uh, but sometimes when you get there, uh, because of all that information you received, it's practical to ask for a, a backup unit. And maybe it's practical to ask for a supervisor. Mm -hmm. So when you get there, maybe there's three, four, five cars there. And that's something the public has brought to our attention sometimes not knowing that process uh, the question is why does it take so many of you to show up for this call one i think that question is asked without knowing what the call is right. and then that question is asked about what you have brought to that call in the way of resources i think maybe you asked for a cit officer to show up so that adds another unit there adds another unit there and that's something I think, you know, I, that's what I hope this process brings out is not just how you do your job but why. and what you bring it and what, but why, but how the citizens see you as you are doing your job. And I think that's really important for, for me anyway to, to bring this out during these uh, talks is so that people, when they look at an officer doing their job, they may stop and think before they criticize the actions that they see but haven't got a lot of information on. And I appreciate you talking about that as it starts, just as a call you receive. What are you, going to, what are you getting into? And if you can prepare for some of that, you bring resources in that then may multiply the number of officers at the scene. And I think that's a sticking point that I have heard from citizens. I drove by and there's a car stop and there's five guys there. 
Well, there might have been five felons in the car, you know, for all you know. Uh, it, it's hard to say that with, without sounding like you're defending mm -hmm. the police, sure. and I think that's where we get off track because I don't see it as a defense of the police. I see it as an explanation of why you have to do your job the way you do it. And so I think that's important uh, as we go through this process uh, so that the public who is watching and the reports that they get from our work as a committee, that hopefully that will help. Because I know I've done that. I mean, I've been on the department, I was on the department, then after I left, my wife and I drive by someplace and go, well, I wonder what's going on there, because you see one or two officers, or four or five officers. The other day I was over visiting a friend of mine. I went outside so I could get better reception with my cell phone, and while I was outside, I see a uniformed officer walking along the sidewalk, coming along the house where I was visiting. I thought, well, that's unusual, where, where'd he come from? And then I see him get to a, a point where he got a little bit down the road, then he looked in a different direction and he waved. And I looked down that way and there was another officer. And about that time, here comes a uh, black and white and there comes uh, a black police officer, uh, I mean, uh, car. And so I knew something was going on in that, in that area. Uh, went back in the house, because uh, I thought it was smarter to do that and stand out in the yard. But again, somebody who's driving by and seeing that and wondering what's going on might make some assumptions that are based on lack of information on how the job has to be done to protect the citizens and the officers. And so I think it's important that you bring that up. It may seem kind of trivial, you know, mm -hmm. well, you're just going to a call. I know from experience that's not the case. Every call you get, your mind starts to click as to what to expect or what to prepare for. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that out. I just wanted to say that. And, and I, I do too. Um, I appreciate it too, Mike, because these are the calls that we get. Um, I had a, actually a council member that called me and the, their neighbor across the street, the door was wide open. And so somebody made the call or the alarm burglary in process, in progress. Um, then an officer showed up and they were on their porch, but the officer never went in the house. And so, and then he hollered at them to get in their house, you know. So they were mad that the officer hollered at them to get in their house when they're trying to watch the door open and the officer wouldn't go in, you know. And I said, well, he's probably waiting for backup. And you guys, I don't mean this, I don't want you to take it badly. You might think this is very, what do I want to say, like, um, you're used to it. Routine. Routine. There we go. That's my word. But it's not routine for me. It, but it's routine for you that I'm waiting on that backup because that door is wide open, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And so we we don't know what kind of burglaries have gone on in that area. We don't know all of all of that that you guys know. Um, so, so yes, we, you know, I, I am glad that you're taking your time to explain that because I do, I really, really think that's important you know I don't know how many times I've heard I tried to flag that officer down and he just said no and he kept on going little did they know he was on his way to another call that was more pressing again it's routine it's natural for you guys but for us we're trying to figure figure all all that out and, you know, and, like, and, and educate them so that we can all get on the same page and we can understand and then our officers as well can understand our eyes and what we see and where we're coming from. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The community needs us and we need you. We need each other. We really have to intertwine. And how do we do that? These are pressing times right now. It's hard for you guys, it's hard for the citizens, but we need each other and we need to come together. We need, and, I, and I say that to people all the time until we can look out your lens and you guys can look out our lens, nothing will ever change. And so I, I appreciate your calmness and telling us that 
But that's why we're coming back with these mm -hmm. scenarios. I've, I've got more that I'd like to talk to you about personally, but, okay. but, but I think it's just, it's just very important because, you know, you're, you're to do your job and you're to do the best at your job and we're back sitting you watch your job and when that doesn't happen, we just don't understand sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you said. Seen them, seen them walking down there. Or yeah, there, there are there are so many uh, scenarios mm -hmm. um, that it would it would be difficult to, right. to to package them up in a in a small package and can and convey um, to our our citizens in a in a simple manner like why why there may that may be that many officers on a call. Um, a lot of information gathered in on the way to a call may result in a lot of officers showing up on that call. The flip side of that is the lack of information um, that we may be able to get on certain emergency calls can elicit even a larger initial response because we have no idea. And I'm glad you said that because I also hear people say, man, they're asking me a million calls. Why don't they just get here? They want to know what the guy was driving, what he was wearing. You know, was he walking a dog? Did the cat jump off the roof? And so they're upset. You know, with with you know the dispatch, and I don't know if you guys have ever heard yeah. that, but I've heard that. Like, I've, I've called. This is my address. Can't you tell this is my address? And so, again, just educating them is so important on yeah, what yeah. what we could really you know, those key things that you really really need. Yeah, our, our dispatch center fields about thirty thousand calls per month, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what was conveyed to me from a dispatch supervisor. Um, when I was given a, a tour <laughs> to a citizen group one time. So a thousand phone calls a day. Um, I can't, I mean, I, I have two phones. Uh, the chief has blessed me with a work phone. Um, <laughs> and I don't, I couldn't answer a thousand <laughs> phone calls a day. So. We could try it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it is difficult. Uh, a citizen may drive by a car stop and see four officers on this car stop. And they might think that that's too many officers. They may think that's a waste of resources, um, but it may be it explains something as simple as the first officer, uh, the officer that made that car stop has a brand new recruit in week one of his training with him, and he asked for a back. And the back that dispatch assigned is another field training officer with another week one uh, recruit officer riding in the passenger seat. Um, and now you have four officers on the scene of a car stop where sure. you really only needed that one back, but you got four. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there, there are many explanations as to why um, citizens may see a, a large group of officers on any given situation. And if, if I can put a plug in here, I know we'll get to it later, but for community policing, I know that that's, I have sat through uh, countless times where whether it's all these people showed up or conversely at least the ones I'm thinking of are nobody showed up. They don't care about us. And, and the officers have been able to explain how that operation goes, just like you are, and that in the case of it appearing that nobody showed up, um, reassuring people that they were there, but they were surveillance, doing surveillance, and so had chosen the tactic not to be that obvious at the time. And I'm not sure there's any way other than just engaging with the public when they have those questions to, to get that kind of information out. But it does help a lot. It's good that you brought that up. Um, we're running out of time. Imagine that. <laughs> um, but this has been some good stuff. Stuff we needed to talk about. Stuff that we needed to clear the air. So mm -hmm. um, what I would like to do is come back to um, standard interaction where we're leaving off. Um, bias and profiling, do the escalation and duty to intervene on our next meeting. Um, I think that looks like that might put us uh, to a point where we could um, like do A, B, C, and then D, maybe any questions. I would encourage citizens if they have questions that they would like answered to get it to us or come down after that and then do a wrap up of just this part of it and then we can figure out what we'll do at our next meeting where we want to go from there so start thinking about where you want to go from there continue to go through the policy um, and we'll pick up there if, if, every, if that's okay with everybody
I think it would help citizens to know exactly who they should send their comments to in this case. They should send their questions or comments Correct. to Liz um, at the uh, council office, or if one of us get it, we can just forward it to Liz. Well, just Liz is E Toyne, E T O Y N E, at Topeka.org. I, I just, people are getting used to sending it to the whole council or governing body yeah. and things like that, but if we want it to Liz, we need to write people. Now, I didn't pick up my phone because I was running out. Um, and neither did I. I did the uh, same thing. I don't know. Um, does anybody have a calendar? Chief, yes. There was a, a citizen who was wanting to know if they have the ability to speak at these. And uh, we will do that next at our next meeting. Okay, we'll we'll so take any questions and comments. Yeah, okay. So if we can put something out about how they go about Right, our next agenda will have that. That's what I said. We'll we'll list all these, get through that, and then and then we'll have a question for that. Okay. I've got a, a text message question from PJ Carter who was here earlier about whether the public could get copies of the packets that we have. Maybe you'd want to address that. These are the policies, but mm -hmm. um, yes, I can. Right, Liz. I can. Yeah, the, um, the majority of the policies are available are posted, on, right? online. Yeah, I would right. say they're posted. But what I'm, what I'm saying is legal doesn't have a problem with what we're sending out, right? Well, with what we're studying, right? We've already sent it to one person. It's all public. It's all public. I just want to make sure. So is, was that PJ? Uh, it was PJ that sent the note. I'm just thinking that either if we wanted to give people a list of what policies we're looking at mm -hmm. so they can look it up themselves or if we're willing to sure. offer that, I think that's that Liz idea. would send them, sure. then whatever is easier. Sure, but, sure. Um, yeah, because they're not looking. Yeah, we can send that to PJ. Um, Liz, if you would do that. Okay, and then we'll, we'll make that clear on our agenda. Okay, I don't have a calendar with me. Period. I've got Does somebody one have a calendar? on my phone. I don't have my phone. No, but I. That's I, what you get when you don't. I it. have one, but I can only look at it for you. Okay. <laughs> I can't put it on the screen. <laughs> okay. Thank you, sweetie. Are you looking for another time to go from three to five? Uh, yes. Um, I was wondering, um, let's see, this is. Uh, Is that Sunday Monday, right? Sunday Monday. Okay. Okay. Could we do something maybe like um, November second? No, that would be a no. week. Huh? The day before election. Well, yeah, that's are right. you busy? No, that is a day. Yeah. <laughs> How about the the ninth? The ninth looks good. In two weeks, since we have all our material, that's what I was looking at. Uh, well, we could do it on the third. We could do an election if you wanted to, Padilla. If you wanted to come here. <laughs> okay, so we'll tentatively set it, um, Liz, for okay. three o'clock on November 9th. Okay. Same location. Same location. Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. I thought parking was pretty decent. Thank well, you. Liz will move us if it's occupied. I'll double check. Okay. All right. We'll do that for right now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. This concludes our meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank, Thank you. you.